Boom! That's it. Hey. We have a special guest. <laughs> ciao Fede, ciao Paolo, what's up? Ciao ciao. Ciao. I'm excited to introduce this guest because it's more than a guest. It's, I would say, a, a friend before everything. And Paolo, when I was in Lisbon for my bootcamp, he has taught me a lot about networking, about connecting with people, about interacting with people. Okay. So my name is Paulo. I am a designer from Portugal, Lisbon, more specifically, currently, um, but uh, on the internet, because right now everybody is everywhere, I think, right? Um, and um, I've been doing design for more than a decade, actually. Uh, but I actually did my first website uh, when I was uh, six years old, so it was like 26 years ago. So I can claim that I, I've been doing websites for 26 years. Um, but um, yeah, uh, I've always been interested in technology and uh, disassembling computers and trying to assemble back together and stuff like that. I studied design, uh, industrial design, like the one that you kind of build physical things because it was the, the closest thing that, uh, that I wanted to do regarding design at the time. Uh, but then I realized it was, it was a too slow of a field. Like if you want to launch a physical product, it's like two, three, four years, you know from design to production mm -hmm. to launch to everything. And that's just too much time. Uh, and um, since I've always been uh, um, playing around the technology from a very young age, I started to do uh, websites and, and stuff like that. And so I became, a, I became a web designer at the time, and then a UX designer, and then a designer, whatever. Oh, wow. Nobody, not, yeah. Not now that there are some labels, you know. That sound, yeah, I, mean, I don't even know. I don't, I don't even know what to call myself. So <laughs> I just start, I just started to call myself a designer designer. I mean, I, I am I am a designer by heart, and I, I think I've been designing from since I was a kid. Uh, but um, uh, I love to, to do design. And more recently, I started to discover that I love to teach design. Um, or, or better yet, to um, mentor and train designers. It's not really about the mm. subject of design, it's about the improvement of the human means human beings that call themselves designers. And um, and so that's what I've been what I've been more focused on lately. But I still do design, I still do design work for, for clients now and then. Let's do this. Now let's uh, let's change the paradigm uh, the paradigm of what we usually do, Raphael. And uh, I think with, cool. with you, Paolo, we can start with uh, uh, the signature question. I feel like I wanna start with that. Because you call it like a, mm. a yourself as a designer designer. So the question that I would mm. like to you, that's our signature question that usually Raffaele asks, but today I'm hijacking the meeting. So I'm asking you, what is a designer today? Please do. What is a designer designer? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's, uh, maybe uh, we should start with what, what is a designer first. Yeah. Um, because a, a designer that designs designers is kind of straightforward, like it's someone that designs designers. But what is a designer, um, and also what is design in general? Because I think that's that's the that's the main thing, right? And um, uh, I mean, uh, I was I was actually thinking about def this definition because I've heard one of your uh, episodes with uh, Lee Robertson or something, and um, he actually also answered that question, and I understood it was a signature question. So I was talk uh, thinking about it a little bit and. The best definition of design that I've come across uh, is one from Jared Spool, which says that design is the rendering of intent. And I really like the definition in the sense that it has two parts. It is the action of rendering, so giving shape, like rendering is giving shape to something, kind of, and uh, of intent, of a, a something that, a goal that something someone has or someone something that someone wants to do, uh, an intention. Mm -hmm. But I think it is... Uh, an incomplete kind of definition because it lacks uh, the way you should do it. So, and I think that the way you should do it is like very carefully rendering the intent. So I would add that design is like careful rendering of intent because mm. it's, it's for sure you, you can feel the difference as a user when you're using certain products or services or whatever. As a human being, you feel certain products and services were designed much more carefully than others. And that's, mm. for me, that's part of the definition because I like to consider design from, from the part of those products and services that you actually really feel that, oh, the person that designed this really thought about it, really care about me as a user designing mm. this, uh, using this and so on. Um, and so I would add like a, a careful rendering of intent. It's, it's for, what for me is the definition of design. And, 
it's wow. a very broad definition in the sense that uh, actually anybody can do it. Like, um, uh, you know, uh, someone that is not trained in design, they can uh, actually really think about something out to give, give shape to something really, really carefully uh, in a way that it fulfills an intent. And that's also designing. I was uh, rereading the other, yeah, I think it was literally yesterday. Um, there is this phenomenal website that is called thinkwithgoogle.com. It's a really nice website uh, where Google puts a lot of like uh, uh, thought leadership or things and experiments that they do. If you've never seen it, there is a plethora of stuff that you can take a look at. And um, they were investigating how intent uh, is literally reshaping, they call it like the, the marketing funnel. But pretty much they were talking about the, the customer journey in general. And what they claim is that people get to a result, to get to a conversion to some extent, in completely different ways. So every journey is unique for each consumer. And they're almost like claiming that doing the typical journey map exercise makes no sense. Because people don't really think in terms of like one journey. Sure, there might be one journey that is more common than another, but it's all about the intent. So mm -hmm. how do I operate? And they were discussing on how, for example, some people might be starting with buying a new set of uh, AirPods, but everything originates uh, with the fact that this person has headache, like light headache every day. And then they found out that, they ha that that's the reason is because they, their uh, earphones that they're wearing is like the similar you're wearing right now, Paolo. Like yes, the big ones that are like a little bit pressing on the side. So by investigating online, they, found, they find that it's because of that that are pressing the temple that they're actually having those headaches. So next step is like, okay, then how can I find the earrings, like the, the AirPods? And at that point, they look to find the best one. Like what are the best ones? The, the Apple one, the Beats one, the Sony, the Logitech, and eventually they perform like a conversion. So it's very fascinating that you mentioned the intent because designing for an intent, uh, it's, it's really something that goes beyond what people will think today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's much more complex than designing for a, a user goal or uh, or or a more or a more defined uh, thing like a conversion or a, a sale or whatever, right? Uh, but that, oh. that's interesting because all of those oh, the, the the critique there on customer journeys and all that it's very interesting because most of the you know the UX um, tools like personas and customer journeys and all that they're all abstractions and they're all uh, summaries of what the reality is, right? They're all proxies proxies of what the reality is. And uh, I think it is, um, you can really tell like a, a very experienced designer from a not so experienced designer when um, the more experienced designer summarizes and uh, distills the information into the customer journey that's more complete and uh, it's more uh, diverse, it's more correct than, than one that it isn't. But they're all exercises in, in reduction and in summarization which means that the quality will be lost somewhere, right? The truth will be lost somewhere, uh, either in personas, customer journey mapping, or whatever. Um, but uh, a really skillful designer has more experience into deciding, should I include this in the customer journey or not? And it's like the, that's like the intuition of a designer that plays a part in that as well. What kind of role plays empathy in this process? Because when you, when you do something with intent, you are consciously doing something, as you said. But uh, what about the empathy? There's there's the whole, there's this whole conversation about empathy in design, which for me it kind of irritates me a little bit because I mean, almost mm. every job needs empathy. I, I I cannot imagine like a job that doesn't need empathy. Uh, like I mean maybe a robot interacting with another robot maybe they don't need empathy between themselves. That's okay, but also they're not human. So, um, but I mean I think every job needs empathy and design obviously needs empathy. But uh, I get a little bit pissed off about the empathy uh, talk because. Most people, first of all, most people uh, confuse empathy with sympathy. I mean, empathy mm -hmm. is to be able to realize what the other people is, not necessarily having sympathy for that. You know, sympathy is uh, after empathy. And also, a lot of people claim to be very empathetic, but I mean, it's very easy to be empathetic with someone that's very similar to you. But mm -hmm. if you have to be empathetic with a, you know, terrorist or a criminal or something like that, that's where real empathy is needed. Like, for example, police officers and and pr 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 prosecutors and people that interrogate terrorists and stuff like that, that's where really a real mm -hmm. empathy exists, you know? Because they, they have to like, okay, I understand why he did what he did. I don't have sympathy for that, but I understand where it comes from. And now I know what kind of questions should I ask to extract whatever I want to extract. It's important uh, what you said, because especially when it comes to 
interviews or usability testing or anything that, that we do as designers. Uh, there is definitely this similarity bias that goes even beyond the uh, design. So when it comes to the fact, as you were saying, Paolo, that you tend to like and understand the people that are similar to you. And that's why you should even trying to avoid to work with people that are just your mini me version of you. Uh, yeah. So you're your clones to some extent. A and what I found interesting about like your, um, your point about empathy and sympathy, going back into the usability testing, a lot of people claim that they are like great interviewers. Uh, and they say, oh yeah, any, everyone can go there, you can do an interview. And they just have a list of, a list of questions and you just do it. But you don't realize that actually getting to the right problem statement or understanding the right root cause, as a, as a policeman does for the interrogation, requires to be able not to bias the person that you're talking to. So even yeah. that sympathy level shouldn't even exist. Because you, mm. you have to behave uh, ideally as a great interviewer, as someone that understands but doesn't provide any information or doesn't provide any bias into the, the person that you're yeah. talking to. And this is like one of the most common errors I've seen done like in many interviews when you're leading with, a, you know, you're like appreciating what people are saying, you're, you're kind of like biasing by posing questions that are not the right way, they're not neutral. And that's where all the, all, all the chaos happens because it's literally the system, if it's trash in, trash out to some extent. So yeah. if you bias your interviewers, then what you get is not what you're looking for. So you won't have your real problem statement eventually or whatever you're yeah. looking for. And that's, that's exactly the, the, mm -hmm. the, the risk, the real risk about the confusion between empathy and sympathy. Because, uh, and I'm, see, I'm, I'm saying this because I see a lot of designers that go into interviews, like you're saying, really sheared up and like trying to create a report, but then they just create a report and that's it. And they get really sympathetic with the user and they don't discover anything new and they don't get any insight and they didn't, don't really understand what the root cause of the problem is and blah, 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 blah. So it is actually a mistake, a big mistake to be sympathetic with your users. You should be empathetic, but mm. not sympathetic. And uh, and a lot of people confuse those two because human beings like to be um, fun to be around other human beings and be cheerful about that and be uh, sympathetic with other human beings. But when you're interviewing for getting insights, it's, it's a different job, yeah. That's a great point. Every time I was doing job interviews, Every time, uh, and I had to be professional and, as you said, empathetic uh, without creating any bias, <laughs> I feel like a jerk all the time because, yeah. personally speaking, I, I'm a very social person and I feel like, oh God, I would love to kind of help you, I would love to tell you more, but I can't. So yeah. how, what about you guys? Did you feel the same? Are you something similar? Are your experience similar? Yeah, I mean, when I feel that, it's when I know that I'm doing the job correctly, basically. <laughs> yeah. It's almost, it's almost as if I need to feel that to be like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm discovering something new. Uh, I'm not saying that you need to be a jerk to be a good interviewer, but uh, you need to know where the line is and not cross it, basically. From my experience, I'm just realizing a little bit better that it's just a, an exchange of value, especially in the first time. So you, yes, you have to be professional, you have to be a human, but it's... At, at least at the beginning, it's just an, okay, I, I can provide you this and I want to discover more on that and stop and not like, I can do this amazing thing that I love right now and so, so goes on. So the, the, the kind of structure, I mean, it's probably crucial, but in, even in terms of wasting time, you know, because I could, I could even build or have already done amazing stuff, but doesn't mean that it's required or doesn't mean that it, 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 it's something fitable for you? Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so, sometimes it's not adequate, so you should not even mention it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and right now that we got almost like entered, uh, it was kind of impromptu and uh, we got into this uh, topic of the interviews. I feel like a lot of the people that are doing it wrong uh, also have the issue with mm. capturing what is the right observation that you get from the person. And uh, I found, for example, very useful whenever there is something that I believe I understood, but uh, I wasn't very sure. I try to rephrase what I just heard and ask the person I'm interviewing to confirm whether or not I got it right. So that's mm. a little trick I started doing uh, and it's incredibly helpful because at the end of the day, you have the confirmation that what you understood is completely right. And at the same way, you kind mm. of like summarize everything the user have been maybe doing in the last 10 minutes uh, in, in just a sentence, right? So you get better in your skills of uh, synthesis to some extent that will help you then uh, when you create insight. But at the same time, you're creating that sort of a, a relationship with the person that you're, that you're interviewing. 
Yeah, and, and also there's a there's also a, I mean the problem that you're talking about is a problem of uh, did you actually listen what the person intended to say, right? And uh, in the in my last projects, I I started to to counter for that by always having two people from our side, the design agency side, listening, and one person talking from the user side. So it was always mm. one user talking, being interviewed, and two people listening, one asking questions and the other one taking notes. And it was amazing to see in the end of the interview how many things both of the designers understood differently. Yeah. You know, they, they heard the same sound, but they understood different things. And I started to realize, oh shit, when we used to do it just one on one, we missed a lot of stuff, right? And we misunderstood a lot of stuff and so on and so on. So when we started to do it with two people, they're like, no, no, he said that because of blah, 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 not because of X, like you're saying. And so um, mm. also listening to the recording again. It's also like mandatory because when you're talking with someone, you're more engaged on the flow of the conversation and um, and uh, making sure you're asking something that's relevant, right? Um, and and when you're listening to the recording, you're just listening and then you understand, oh, shit, like there was a miscommunication here. He said X and I didn't listen to that and I said Y. So there was a misinterpretation there. That's why I didn't understand what he said after and so on. Um, it's very important to either re-listen to the conversation or have two people listening to them and exchanging notes because I mean a lot of things go through the cracks and we don't understand them especially because when you're interviewing mm -hmm. it's most of the time it's such a short time and you come up you kind of come with an agenda like you have your questionnaire you know that you want to get that information out so sometimes you get caught into keeping the rhythm and you're like oh okay I have to have, ask the next question then the next one and the next one so the interviewer is always there kind of like panting and thinking about, oh, I, I need to really get to the end of this, but I need to have all the information, while the other person is really just focusing on understanding what the interviewee is saying. So I couldn't agree more. Yeah. It's a completely different... Mm, I, sometimes the interviewer is... It, it, it is very tough to to listen and, and ask questions at the same time. Yeah, and, and also because you're improvising, basically. I mean, uh, you're, you're listening to the, to, to the answer of the person, but you're already thinking about the next question, if it makes sense or not, are you going to ask it, are you going to phrase it? So it's always a bit of improvisation. And when you are on that creating kind of mindset of like improvising what you're going to ask next, you're not really listening. That's the thing. I mean, it's, it's too much of a work for one brain alone. So <laughs> you better have two brains there to make sure that you listen to everything. Do you think that technology nowadays could help us shape a better shape a better like interview experience? I've actually been a subject, been been a user that I was being interviewed, and uh, it was on this mm. uh, COVID era, and so we did a Zoom call, and um, there was like uh, three people on the Zoom call from their side, me as the user, right? But they were also live streaming it to the rest of the team. Sometimes they would ask me something and I would say blah, 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 the answer, right? And, uh, and then they were like, oh, one of our colleagues uh, actually asked us to ask this. I think that using this kind of, uh, this kind of tools, like doing a Zoom conversation and uh, having a lot of people listening, more people than the ones that are actually on the call, it's really useful to catch those things. Oh, why did you say this? Ask him why he, did, why he said that or ask him why he did that, so on, so on. Because sometimes the interviewers don't understand all those and they don't ask all those questions. And so having more people listening in, it's actually useful to have better questions asked. And uh, it actually happened in one specific sense that I was telling a story of how we do design projects, blah, 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 because it was for a design tool. Um, and so um, I said that we did something and then um, they asked us, someone that was watching the live stream, uh, asked the interviewers to ask me, um, why didn't we go with another tool? Uh, which did which is exactly the thing that uh, we I was talking about, and then we I was like ah yeah that's actually a good question we didn't go with them because we had tried them in the past and then um, it didn't really work and it was too expensive blah 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 and then we started talking about pricing you know regarding the two and that was kind of the conversation mm. that they, they that they wanted to have really because they wanted to discover the right pricing for their for their for their product and so actually that particular question that came from the outside audience that was not on the call actually led the conversation to the right to the place that they wanted to to, to lead actually so i think technology helps uh, in this regard in the sense that if you do it live on a zoom call streaming to the rest of the company you can have much more direct feedback 
uh, from the interviewee. Like the, someone in the company could ask a question and get the answer right away. You don't need to do a second interview or whatever to, to find out those information. So um, I, I, think, I think it is much faster to do interviews remotely, actually. But you need to do more interviews because still you're not in person. You don't understand the body language. There's a lot of things that you miss. And so to balance that, you should interview more people, which is actually good. You know, it's actually very good to interview more people because that's the best way to ensure that you have enough diversity in the people that you interview, which is like the most important thing in research, actually. I will answer your question by mentioning two examples. The first one uh, that is kind of surprising is when I had to, do, to interview a financial company and we were also doing a shadowing session. So we were pretty much, for the people that don't know what a shadowing session is, we were sitting next to the user, basically asking her to do something and we were just supposed to watch. So you don't really ask too many questions, you let her complete her task and then at the end you can have a little bit of a discussion understanding why why she did what she did and the funny part is that uh, with the people of the company we were working for that said uh, pre-covid okay yeah and this person is going to be virtual and that's the first time in my life i've ever done like a virtual shadowing because i'm like how the hell as you said paolo i need to sit next to her to see what she's doing because the body language and everything it plays a huge role but at the same time, by using all these uh, uh, virtual uh, connectors uh, and uh, the sharing screen, it was interesting because our full attention was on the screen, so on the activity that she was doing. So it was kind of new even for us as interviewer to do that, because you can, uh, of course, as you know, most of the, the tools don't allow to see the face and, what, and the sharing at the same time. So we can only see either her face or the, the screen. So it was kind of new, but it was interesting. And, and that was a new way where you can use technology for doing the same thing in a different way. And on the other side, something where technology is helping a lot, uh, and now it's almost fantastic, are uh, something that we recommend you to use, and there are many of them, the text, uh, sorry, the speech to text converter. Yeah. Where you just put your recorder and you have like the, the recording and the script of everything a person say. So the notes yeah. need to be much lighter, but more crisp, but you can always go back and check literally the transcript of what that person said. And that's phenomenal. That works mm. so great, at least for me. Yeah. And, and, and it's actually, a, a, it actually changes the whole note taking process because when you're doing it live, even if you're recording, you still write some quotes, you know, you, you still write like, she said this and she said that. Um, and for, for and me, for example, I write like the timestamp like 30 minutes, 30 seconds, she said this, like I look at the recording and I write that, which then it's, mm. a, it's, a, it's a, a bullshit of a job because then I have to go to the audio file, seek to the 30 minutes, 30 seconds and actually listen to it and get the clip and blah, blah, blah. So now there's all these tools that uh, do this automatically basically. And you just need to, while you're doing the interview, you just need to like bookmark a specific timestamp and then you, and then you see it live. Um, actually the, the tool that I was being interviewed for that I was telling you about is a tool that does exactly that. So they were demonstrating also that kind of uh, capability. Yeah. Oh, nice. And wow. While while That's I was being cool. interviewed, while I was being interviewed, there was one one designer we, on the call we, that she was like annotating uh, all this, all the like the the text of, of what I was saying. And I mean, it, it is wonderful if you speak in English, and if you speak uh, non-accented English, but um, but still, it works really great. It's it's amazing. Uh, yeah, it's true. But on the other side, and of course, you know, I, I'm 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 Italian, like Raffaele, and I work in the United States. Having that tool working uh, uh, as, a, as a non-English speaker, uh, not as a first language, actually, I'm an English speaker, but not first language, into with that tool helps a lot uh, because eventually you can get some of the nuance that at the very first pass you don't get. And you know what I'm thinking right now? At least it also happened with my Siri. I start noticing that when you have like a, a really heavy accent, like the Italian can be one, it's true. the Spanish, or the Indian, or some like even the Scandinavian, those uh, kind of like voice assistant understand and recognize your accent so much better because it's so strong in, in some in some situation and in some phrases or in some words uh, that works even better than my Siri in Italian works with me when I speak Italian. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. Jesus, this is like incredible. Yeah, well, it has it has more Italian uh, in, um, English speaking in America trying to speak it uh, speak speak to her in English, so it has to. The AI is more trained in that in that regard. Regarding the accent, if you said Siri in like 
English UK rather than English US. It's it's different the pronunciation of Hey Siri from like Hey Siri. It's it's weird. I mean, I I know that because my brother is a is a teacher and he, he when he just came to me with this, I was like mind blowing. But it's technology, guys. You, you know what? Keeping on on this same thread, uh, I have a question for you guys now. Um, how do you usually move into the next phase? So once the the let's say the the, the interview is done. How do you guys move from mm. synthesizing what you have as observation to turn them into insight? What is your process? I was I was teaching uh, a design course uh, last year, um, and um, one of the students asked me that, and we kind of come up with a with an answer that I'm trying to to tell you guys. I mean, um, uh, th that's actually um, a very um, nuanced nuanced and detailed kind of knowledge because. It's really hard to know, should I keep doing more interviews or should I go to the next step or should I keep doing more wireframes or should I go to the next step? The few things that you can try to measure how good is the intuition of the designer that's deciding that. Because I think the, the actual way to decide that is from a designer's intuition. And I, mm. I think that you need to keep in mind that the goal is not to have X number of interviews or X number of wireframes or X number. The goal is like to launch a new product or do a redesign of a product that's successful. Like the goal is like in the end, you know. And so what we came up with in this class that, that I was teaching was that um, if the goal is this final thing and this final thing is like, you know, a prototype that has been user tested and it's ready to go for development or whatever it is. Uh, that's usually like the end of the of the design cycle and then it goes into the development, right? Um, but if that's the goal, all the decisions in between, like do I have enough research, do I have enough definition, do I have enough design, blah, 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 they should all be based on do I have enough to go to the next step and am I confident enough on what I did to go to the next step? Because, you know, the design phase, they all be, build on each other and so... Um, the ultimate goal is like the ultimate, it's the final deliver, deliverable, right? And so to be able to have that uh, intuition that tells you, yeah, I think this is enough, or no, I don't think this is enough, that's actually the landmark of an experienced designer. Because if you don't have that intuition, you basically are, you start spinning your wheels, doing too many re-interviews or doing too many wireframes or doing too many whatever, right? Um, and so usually I'm a bit more uh, risky and I go forward with less information, like I'm too confident sometimes, and sometimes I have to go back, and that's okay. Like, I, I, I eat a part of the problem that I'm trying to solve that I don't know enough, okay, let's do a bit more research about that. And I'm okay with sometimes going back and forth like that, but I prioritize, you know, progress, and so um, I try not to get spinning my wheels because that uh, pisses me off as well, so. I, I, I prefer to go forward and then if I miss something, I'll go back, no worries. Well, for me, let me say that during the phases of the, of the, of the design thinking steps, you will always be sure that there are some divergent and convergent phases, but there are no instruction of how long the, these two steps should be, right? So, so th th that's what, I, what happened with a recent project that I've made. And actually, I was uh, tired to test um, the usability and the, um, the the value that user perceived from this product, right? And my research ended up ends up like not immediately, but it was super easy when focusing on a goal to discover this. And I was not sure, but I I was like, okay, I, I got it. And it was strange because it was like immediately in a, in, a, in a in a short amount of time compared to other projects. So what I'm trying to say here is uh, um, follow a structure and a, a process, but don't rely on enough time because the time, it's I think it comes from the value of of what you are getting from. It's it's not better about how how long does it take to do yeah. this or do that. My mistakes have always been to research more to go to go without a limit because I was at the beginning so curious and I was I would start to research on something that like wasn't part of the problem so yeah but, for me but, but it's, that, that's it's, okay it's I mean the the um, and I, I also do agree with that I also do agree that 
you should measure that based on the value that you've extracted and not like the number of hours that you spend doing X, right? Because that's what uh, efficiency is about. Like if you are really efficient at doing it, you'll do it faster than, mm. than some other person. But it also depends a lot on the project at hand and the stakeholders that you have and all those things. Because uh, honestly, to go from the divergent phases to the conversion phases, it's always like a business decision. Usually it should be a business decision mm. because the stakeholders that are involved should agree, okay, yes, we've researched enough and we defined enough. So now we know what we're going to do and everybody signs off on that. And then mm. the design part comes and the testing part comes and all that. So, uh, I mean, it, it also depends a lot on the, on the speed of the organization that, or the team or the company that you're working with as well. There is a thing though that I get mm. from what you guys are saying. That is, um, it's a, a confirmation of what uh, I think, for example, on the other side, the business doesn't understand so well from the, what is my experience. That is, they still think to waterfall-ish in terms of one thing is research, then when it's done, research is done, we do the create, we do the define, uh, sorry, define, create, prototype and testing, etc. Instead of really thinking of sprints uh, and what mostly I would say some of the business people don't understand is testing it's still understanding so research and testing is still understanding to us as a designer so if we shorten up the research at the very beginning it's because probably as i would say by design we might need more testing to make sure that the assumption we have are good or are actually exact so this is almost like an elastic band right you can pull and push mm -hmm. to adjust to what happens according to the insight that you gather but eventually you have to stay mm. agile and probably that's why it's called agile i don't know uh I don't want to sound, it sounds very obvious but the idea is uh, i think we need to make this mindset uh shift uh, from where oh research is done and and now we're all, we only have to create no that's bs yeah. it's we do research we do something we create something we test it we learn more and then we change it and then we run the wheel again and again and again uh, I mean, it is not like you start one thing and then you end it. It's not like that. But um, we need to take into account that um, the kind of decisions that designers make and when it is designers that make these decisions, because sometimes it's not, the decisions about deciding the plan of the design project, like we're going to do this this amount of research, this amount of blah, blah, blah. Like defining this plan is designing the first thing and the most important thing of the project that you're going to do, you know? And sometimes... It's not designers that decide that. It's like the you know product manager or whatever someone someone else that decides this, and that's already quite wrong, right? Because um, uh, it should be the person that's going to do the job, or the group of people that are going to do the job, to decide on the plan on how they actually can accomplish that with their own skill sets, their own knowledge about their own speed, blah blah blah. blah. Uh, mm -hmm. And so those types of decisions, which are like the first decisions that you take on the project, are actually the most impactful ones on the success of the project or not, because it's very common for designers to design on a specific plan and then it doesn't work or it's wrong and you have to adjust it in, in the middle and then the business side of things will be like, oh, but you told us that it's going to be blah and now it's X and so on. So uh, those types of decisions, I don't have another answer besides you need to have failed enough times to not fail again <laughs> because it's really <laughs> tricky to, to come up with the right plan. Uh, and it's just like, in my case, I think it's just experience that tells, that tells you what, what you should go to. And, um, and I also have kind of a rule, which is you should always follow the process in the terms of that you don't skip any stage, but you can customize the stages. Like you can customize the activities within the stages according to that specific project, those specific stakeholders and so on. And I think that's also a type of design because you're designing the project basically you're designing like the what you're going to do you're designing how you're going to design the thing basically and so um that's that's a very impactful kind of design as well spend less time to plan and more time to to actually do this stuff to do that because in the moment that you are doing you are learning you are testing and you are measuring it that is probably the best way i have had to learn and with, with failures because because you will fail, everyone will fail, and when when you will still when you are still failing, celebrate failures, and at the same time, don't overdo on planning. Yeah, I, I, I mean, uh, it, it really depends on the context that uh, the design mm. team is operating. I mean, if you have, if you're a design agency, you usually 
you come up with a plan first and you sell the plan to the client and the client accepts that and this project starts and then it has to follow the plan. You cannot deviate just not even millimeter, right? Which is also dumb. Uh, but if you're in a inside team working on a product, the, pro the product manager says, oh, we need to do this new feature or whatever. And you're like, okay, it'll take us two weeks. Uh, and then you, you start doing it and you come up with a plan as you go or you already have kind of a, a structure or a, a sprint structure or whatever in that organization. So it really depends a lot on, on the context of where our designers are operating. But still, yeah, independently sure. of the context, designers need to take these decisions, these decisions, which is how are we going to design this? And that's actually designing the design project. That's, that's pretty meta, but pretty, pretty important as well. I couldn't agree more with that because... I remember when I started, uh, and I, Raffaele knows, but I, I call myself like an hybrid. I'm, let's say, half strategist and half designer or whatever. I mean, the, the percentage doesn't really matter, but I'm, so, let's say so I'm an hybrid. A, a designer, You're just a designer, you mean? Okay, exactly. That's <laughs> all. <laughs> the, 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 what I learned is that by embracing different lifestyles, and when I started working with creatives and technologists, aka okay, coders or engineers, whatever you want to call it, and business people, so all these different personalities, they all have different behaviors and different mindset and different work style. When it comes to creator, creative people, it's very hard for them to work in a kind of like nine to five environment. You cannot ask a creative to produce that something by that date. It's almost like creatives, and I don't want to generalize, but one thing is that they are allergic to milestones. You know that they will get there eventually, but you cannot expect to get there like in a linear way. That's how an engineer works, right? That's how a coder works. They will do a little by little, a building block every day, and they will get there. Not a creative. A creative can do go all the way around, and I hope you guys are watching on YouTube because I'm doing very stupid gestures with my hand, like a pure, a real Italian. <laughs> but the idea is, if I have to, a diagram where I could like literally draw this, a creative will work that way. So I had to accept, understand, and figure it out that work style in order to be successful were successful in working with creative people otherwise it was giving me anxiety at the same time because as you said paul if i'm a client mm. and i don't see my wireframe and it's like being what halfway through the project i'm like uh -uh, where is my stuff so yeah I, I love though that you mentioned that designers should design the project as well because that makes them accountable for what they're gonna do yeah and and, and the problem is even bigger than that because i mean if you're if you are a designer working somewhere uh, and you're listening to this and you're thinking, oh, I never had the opportunity to plan my own design work. My manager just tells me what to do. Then there's that, that's a power issue. That's literally a power issue and a power problem because who has the power in that relationship is the manager. The designer has no power. The designer just does what is told. And so a designer that, that it is in that situation should strive and should fight to have more power and that, that fight could start from, okay, manager, let me plan a little bit of this, of this next project and let me define how long is it going to take and let me do part of the planning. Because, uh, I mean, that's where, that's where power comes from in the, in, the, in the sense that if we designers can control what we're doing and how we're doing, it means that we have, we have a little bit of power in that regard, you know? It's not a business people t telling us when and how we should do things, you know. Uh, it should be design people do, doing that. And so, um, some designers, I think, need to realize that they need to uh, fight for that power and conquer that power. And I'm using these heavy words on purpose because it's kind of like this series of a fight. And sometimes they don't realize that they don't even have power at all. But if you start by grabbing a little bit of that power, when you can decide how are you going to run this next project, then you start to feel actually the responsibility of it. Because then you committed yourself that you're going to do this by then, and then you have to do it, right? <laughs> because otherwise you'll, you'll you'll fuck it up, and mm. nobody will ever trust you, and blah blah blah. So so that's where that's where power is born, but also how you keep power and how you uh, become a more responsible uh, designer and also a better designer. I would say I hear a lot of designers saying, "Oh, but I work in this context, and I cannot decide what the project is, and I cannot do this, blah blah blah." So complaining mm. about the state where they are, you know. Mm. Yeah, complaining about, oh, my manager is stupid, they don't understand about design, or my client is stupid, they don't understand about design. Oh, I'm going to create a website called Plans from Hell and make fun of them, right? That's the typical 
designer approach, <laughs> which is not really productive. I mean, uh, it's you need to, in my in my mind, I mean, you need to understand that that's ultimately a power issue. Who decides how the project is going to be done has the power. And if you design and want to have more liberty in how you work and decide how you work, you should fight for that power, basically, and not complain about not having the power. I want to ask you as a last question about the Lisbon UX scene that you are taking care of right now. Uh, I would love to ask you how the COVID was there in Lisbon from a UX point of view and what is what do you think it's the future right now for, for, for the UX market in Lisbon? So I've been working in Lisbon because I live in Lisbon uh, and I've also mm-hmm. been uh, organized some design meetups and all that. All of this pre-COVID, right? Um, I mean, physical, presential talks and all that. Um, and uh, uh, we need to keep in mind that uh, Portugal is a small country. The economy is not that strong. And in Lisbon specifically, most of the economic growth was from tourism and related activities. And so with COVID, with uh, the airports shut down and not everybody coming to Lisbon and all that. Uh, basically, for overnight, you saw a lot of, you know, a lot of shops closing, a lot of businesses closing, a lot of people getting fired, all that. Um, and so, the interesting thing with COVID is that, especially in the way that it affects Lisbon, is that um, for the first time, the job market, at least for designers, it's it's a unique situation because there's a lot of good, very very talented people that were fired. Uh, that were now in the job market looking for jobs. And so uh, people that were not that good, they are not getting job offers, you know. And so there's a lot of there's a lot of supply in the market right now. And companies that have open positions, basically they just have um, open positions for like four months, which is weird. Like they should have hired someone already. And so basically what they're doing is that they're just waiting to see how the world is going to react, how the economy is going to react to then pull the trigger and actually hire the people. I, I've been hearing from a lot of designers some, some things like, oh, I already did the recruiting process, they already said that I was the right person, but it's only to start in September, or it's only to start in October, or it's only to start blah, 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 and they will tell me then. It is a way for, for, for the companies to say, yeah, we have a little bit of money, we want to hire more people and want to grow, but we're not pulling the trigger yet because we don't know what's going to happen with, with the world and COVID and all that. So uh, right now there's a lot of uh, designers looking for work in Portugal and in Lisbon specifically. Uh, and the good thing is that they're now also starting to look abroad uh, because they are forced to basically. And they are applying to international companies working remotely from Lisbon, which is a very sweet setup. So uh, I actually recommend people doing that. The market is a bit strange. It has been picking up. Lately, like I see more and more uh, companies investing a little bit more on design, but it will take a while until it reaches the point that it was pre pre COVID. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wait, wait for me. I dream to to come back to Lisbon because Fede, it's it's, it's amazing. I mean, oh, I've been to Lisbon. I love it. It's it's amazing. It's, it's a great amazing. city. Paolo, yeah. uh, Paolo, thank you so see much. See you soon in Lisbon with Federico, probably. If you want It'll to be come. great. Uh, That'll be great. Yeah. yeah. We'll be coming and yeah, surfing. Well, uh, We like the big waves, cold ocean yeah. and big waves. That's how we like it. It's a bit, a little bit north of Lisbon, but that's where it happens. Yeah, that's the name of the squad. Thank you so much, Paulo. Obrigado, guys. Obrigado. Bye bye. Ciao. Ciao. Bye-bye. Ciao. Have a nice one.